Good evening and welcome to, tonight, to tonight's webinar. This is the PACET webinar and tonight we're going to talk about some configuration issues with routers and switches. Uh, the topic is taken from the Network Plus Exam N10-005 and the exam objective is 2.1. In that objective there are some considerations that you need to think about with switches and with routers, and then we cover a couple of diagnostic considerations. And with that, let's go ahead and begin talking about some switch considerations. The first thing that we need to talk about is what kind of switch it is. There's basically two kinds of switches. Well, there's actually three, but we're only going to really talk about two. There is the managed switch and the unmanaged switch. An unmanaged switch is a simple switch. <clears throat> Excuse me. You plug it in and it just works. There's really nothing that you can do to configure it. It's just there to transfer network traffic. These tend to be the switches that you would pick up at like Staples or Best Buy. Uh, they're the small office, home office switch. The other kind of switch is a managed switch. Now, these can be configured. As a matter of fact, they are highly configurable. And you configure them either through a cable connection or through a connection via a browser. Now, managed switches do provide for a high degree of network customization and control. While on the other hand, the unmanaged switch is more about ease of installation. Now, Cisco makes some pretty complex uh, network switches, and that tends to be what I'm familiar with. And let me tell you, they are very configurable. You can really break things up with, with those switches. And talking about that, let's talk about VLANs. A switch network may or may not involve the use of virtual local area networks, VLANs. And actually, depending upon the size of your network or what you're doing with your network, VLANs or a VLANs, multiple, excuse me, would be highly desirable. If you happen to have a multi-switch network in which VLANs, there are multiple VLANs, that means that your switches will be required to have at least one trunk port connecting to each other. This trunk port is used to pass VLAN traffic from switch to switch. That way you can have um, like VLAN 20 on one switch and have it pass information to VLAN 20 on the other switch. The protocol that's used on that trunk port is 802.1Q. That is the open source standard. The graphic that I have here to the right is actually a little bit of an older Cisco graphic. And the trunk port on this one is labeled ISL. That was Cisco's proprietary trunk port um, protocol. It's no longer supported by Cisco, they've moved to 802.1Q. Then there's VTP, virtual trunk port. Now this is a protocol or method of automatically updating VLAN information and configuration between switches. Now this is Cisco proprietary and it is still a valid protocol as far as Cisco is concerned. Uh, it's actually very handy. You can take a, a Cisco switch and label it as the VT, VTP server and load the configuration in it. And when you fire up another switch that is designated a VTP client, it will actually get its VLAN configuration from the other switch and provide that out to its network. It's a handy method for uh, passing that information and for keeping things current. Now let's talk about VLAN assignment. On a managed switch, <coughs> excuse me, 
you can assign VLANs by port. That means that each port on the switch is assigned to a specific VLAN. And then when a device is attached to that port, it gets assigned to the VLAN that the port has been assigned to. That is called a static VLAN. Your other way of assigning VLANs is by the MAC address, by the media access control access. Media access control address, excuse me. In this case, each device is assigned to a specific VLAN. When that device gets connected to a port, the port gets configured to being the proper VLAN. This way, a device can plug into any port and remain in the VLAN that it's supposed to remain in. Now, this type of a VLAN is called a dynamic VLAN. They are harder to manage, <clears throat> but they do have some advantages, especially if you have a fairly mobile uh, workforce. They can just take their computer with them, plug it into a port, and voila, they're connected to where they need to be connected to. Some network switches have what's called, it would, is called power over Ethernet. <clears throat> and this is in some of their ports. Now, a power over Ethernet port not only provides network traffic, but it also provides an electrical current. Uh, it provides enough current to power some small devices, like wireless access points or voice over IP phones. And they are only found in higher-end switches. Now let's talk about the interface configuration. Some of the things that you need to consider are your port duplex settings. Are you going to run full duplex or half duplex? Now I really recommend full duplex when you can because it allows more traffic. It can send and receive at the same time. At the same time, excuse me. But it is highly dependent upon the device that's on the other end of that port. Uh, if that device on the other end of the port can only operate in half duplex, then guess what? Your port should be set to half duplex. Uh, that's getting harder and harder to find that situation. So I would recommend full duplex. Now you need to think about your port speed settings. Um, some devices may or may not be able to function at the same speed as the switch. Uh, if you do manual configuration, then you need to make sure that you match the speed on the other end. Uh, well, you don't have to. You could run slower, or you could run, try and run faster, uh, but I don't recommend it. Allowing the ports to auto-negotiate the speed is probably your best course of action. Then there's IP addressing. Um, managed switches do require their own IP address. If they don't have their own IP address, then you're not going to be able to configure them through a web-based browser. And you have to be able to, to get to that IP address in order to do it. Also, each VLAN will have its own IP address range. You need to consider that when you're um, configuring your switch. Also, whether or not you're going to have MAC filtering. Now, MAC filtering is a security method in which only clearly defined devices are allowed to connect to a network. And they're defined, the defining identifier is their MAC address. Now, this can become a bit cumbersome to administer as the network grows. But there is a form of security that's called a sticky MAC address. And what that means is that the first, <clears throat> once that port is configured with sticky, the first device that gets plugged in, its MAC address gets registered. Now, that will be the only MAC address that is allowed to access that port up until that port gets reconfigured by an administrator. I do recommend putting uh, MAC address filtering in place and making it sticky. Uh, that eases the configuration and ups the security. So now let's move on to some router considerations. <clears throat> 
the first thing that we need to talk about is your routing table. So there are static in routes and dynamic routes. We're going to talk about static routes first. Now, if you're going to do static routing, that means that you will manually input a route into each router. So if you have three routers, you go to router A, and they're labeled A, B, and C. You go to router A, and you say, if I want to go to B, here's where I go. If I want to go to C, here's where I go. And then you go to router B. And you go, hey, if I want to go to A, this is the route I go. If I want to go to C, this is the route I go. And then you go to router C, and you go, if I want to go to A, this is the route. If I want to go to B, this is the route. Uh, works fairly well for small, for small networks, but guess what? As your network grows, it really becomes unmanageable. Uh, don't really recommend static routing. If you're going to run more than two or three routers, just just from the management standpoint, in that case, I would recommend dynamic routing. And if you're going to use dynamic routing, now you need to determine which routing protocol you're going to use. Now we will be talking about routing protocols in a future webinar. Just know that there are some that are out there. There's RIP, there's OSPF, and there's EIGRP if you're running a Cisco router. Actually, not even if you're just running a Cisco router anymore, because they made it open source. So you do have those routing, dynamic routing protocols that are available. Now let's talk about NAT and PAT. Uh, NAT stands for Network Address, Address Translation, and PAT stands for Port Address Translation. And what this does is this helps your network in two ways. The first thing is that the first thing that you need to consider is that private IP addresses addresses are not routable. They are not a non-routable address. And you should be using private IP addressing, a private IP addressing scheme inside your network. So now if your net if a client on your network wants to access an outside resource, how does it do it? Because its IP address is not routable. That is where NAT and PAT come into play. As I mentioned just a moment ago, NAT stands for Network Address Translation. It translates a private IP address to a single public address. The router has a pool of these public routable IP addresses that are available to reach the outside. So if client A wants to get to the outside, it is assigned, essentially, one of those public routable addresses. If you use NAT, the relationship is one-to-one. -one. That means for as many public IP addresses that you have available for outside routing, that's the number of inside hosts that can reach the outside. Doesn't work so well. Uh, routable public IP addresses tend to get expensive rather quickly, and it becomes cumbersome, and it's a waste to have those in the pool if they're not being used. The method to, to solve that is PATH which is port address translation. It works real similar to NAT, but you only have one or two routable public IP addresses, and when host A wants to get to the outside, well, then the router says, okay, you're going to get the public IP address, and it's going to be on port 65, 65100. That's how I'm going to track your traffic. I just assigned you a specific port. That way I know who you are. This is a dynamic port numbering system, and it's a one-to-many relationship, and it works really well. You can have thousands of concurrent connections. As many as your bandwidth will allow off of one IP address all with different hosts. I do recommend using PAT 
I do not recommend using NAT. So now let's move on to traffic filtering. Uh, traffic filtering, well, some network traffic is, is desirable and some is not. Some traffic you want to allow into the network, some you don't. Some you want to allow out and some you don't. This is where traffic filtering comes into place. Filtering traffic reduces the undesirable traffic that crosses through or crosses out of your network. Now, access control lists are a form of traffic filters. So they're a very common filter. You can design an ACL that will filter by a multitude of criteria. You can filter by IP address. You can filter by protocol, by port, by time of day. If you can think of a criteria that your network can measure, or your network can register, then you can create an ACL to filter it. The one thing that I will say about ACLs, at least if you're dealing with Cisco, all ACL, all access control lists end with an implicit deny all statement. And what that means is that if it is not specifically allowed, then it is not allowed. And with ACLs, you start at the top of the list. And if, if it doesn't match the first rule, it moves to the second list. If it doesn't match that rule, it moves to the third rule. Until it matches a rule. Once your traffic matches a rule, it exits the ACL. So with that implied or that implicit deny all that's at the end of the ACL, guess what happens if you don't match any of that traffic or any of those filters? You get bounced. Another thing that I've seen is a network administrator started an ACL, didn't put any in any rules, closed down the ACL, figured he'd get back to it in a little while. Guess what happened? No traffic went went through that port. Uh, because of the implicit denial statement. So you need to be careful when you're crafting your ACLs. Another thing we need to talk about is quality of service. Why? Well, because not all network traffic is created equal. Some is more important than others. Quality of service is the setting of priority for network traffic. You as the network administrator get to set the quality of service. If you don't set the quality of service, everything gets an equal chance on your network. And in cases where you have uh, sensitive bandwidth sensitive applications like voice over IP, you may not have a very high quality voice over IP solution. This is where a quality of service comes into play. You set that priority for those packets. You would give a higher priority to voice over IP as opposed to, say, email. Who cares if their email is a little bit slow, especially if it makes their phone calls a whole lot smoother? So remember that quality of service, you, the network engineer, get to decide that. So now let's move on to some diagnostic considerations. We're only going to touch on this briefly. And like the rest of this, I'm going to move fast. You ready? Okay. The first thing that we're going to talk to is a diagnostic tool. Actually, the title there says tools. We're going to talk about a tool. And the one we're going to talk about is the Simple Network Management Protocol, version 2 and version 3. That's SNMP2 or SN SNMP3. Why don't we talk about SNMP1? Well, because it's not secure. Version 2 and version 3 are secure. Now, SNMP allows a network administrator to view and analyze a network's health from a central location. What you do is you define the criteria that you want to measure. And you place monitors or traps on the network. 
when a situation occurs that trips the trap, then it sends a message to a management console. <clears throat> it can also be configured so that it will send an email or text message, SMS message, to a network administrator if a critical occurrence has occurred. SNMP is a cool tool. Uh, you can configure it in a ton of different ways. You can, you can measure and analyze CPU utilization on routers, bandwidth, uh, protocol traffic, just about anything. If you can define it on the network, you can set an SNMP monitor for it. But the only thing is, is the more that you set, the more bandwidth they take because you will trip those traps and you will be sending messages. Also, you got to remember to look at that management console uh, on a regular basis and review those logs because it doesn't do you any good to set the traps if you're not going to review the information. The other tool that I'm going to briefly mention are switch and router dashboards. A lot of switches and routers have software with them that is graphical in nature. And if you log into them via a web browser, they can tell you about the health of that switch or router. They are kind of handy to have. Another diagnostic tool that you can use is port mirroring. This is where an administrator sets up a specific port to receive a copy of all network traffic going into and out of another designated port. That would be the mirrored port. This is a passive method of analyzing traffic. It does not interfere with the activity on that mirrored port. What this is good for is this is good for analyzing server usage. You can look at the requests, the packets for the requests going into the server and the responses coming out of the server. It can help you to de determine whether or not your server is being utilized correctly, whether it's at capacity, whether you need to install a new server, so on and so forth. Another use for port mirroring is security. You can look at all the packets that are going into and out of a port without interrupting the flow. This way you can look for, sus for suspicious packages. Packets, excuse me. To see whether or not everything is as it should. Now that concludes tonight's webinar. Uh, thank you for listening. On behalf of PACET and Edmonds Community College, I really appreciate the opportunities that this course gives and I wish you all a good night.